Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to our last of the winter series, our wonderful lecture by Michael Kent. I need to do a little bit of housekeeping, and then I'll introduce Mr. Kent, and then we'll enjoy an hour of a lecture. First, please turn off your cell phones. This presentation is being recorded, so be careful when you whisper because actually it gets picked up. So watch what you say. Oh. Okay. It is a real honor to introduce a couple of our elected officials. Mayor Mahoney, Irish, could you stand up please? That's our mayor from Chesapeake Beach. He very rarely misses one of our events. Mickey Hummel is our town council member for North Beach. We need to talk about our wonderful library partners. So in the back, Robin, would you stand? Martha Graham, head of our friends, stand. And then our local Twin Beaches. Come on, Joni. Yay! Okay, now it's my honor to introduce Michael Kent. Michael was actually born in Calvert County in 1957. He learned so much about his family roots and everything that he knew came from his mother and his grandparents. He attended Mount Hope Elementary School when it was segregated in 1962. As a result of desegregation, Michael ended up going to multiple schools, the first of which was Mount Harmony in Owens during fifth and sixth grade. He eventually graduated from Northern High School in 1975. His education didn't stop there. He went on and worked for the Navy as a civilian in Warminster, Pennsylvania. He went to high, I'm sorry, he went to night school at Penn State campus and he eventually started a master's program at the University of Pennsylvania. Michael entered law school at the University of Baltimore, Maryland in 1981. While he was in law school, he worked for the state's attorneys in both Prince George's and Baltimore counties. His goal is to preserve Calvert County black history and to ensure that future generations know their history. He continues to disseminate as much information as possible by working with the Calvert School, our Calvert Libraries, the Historical Society, the NAACP, and the Maryland Commission for African American History and Culture. Michael, it is a real honor to have you today. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to try to speak as loud as possible, but if you can't hear me, just start waving and then I'll, I'll speak louder. One correction I have to make is that I did work for the uh, Navy as a civilian for a while, but I was actually on active duty in the Navy, uh, first as a signalman and then as a lieutenant uh, uh, when I came out, 1980 something or whatever. So I'd like to start off these uh, programs by telling you how I know the things that I know and maybe giving you some resources that you can go to and check these things out. So it initially started by getting a lot of oral histories from my family. Uh, my family, the Kent side of the family, has been in Calvert County uh, since 1780. It's the earliest documentation that we have. At that time, we were owned, or they were owned, I should say, by the Kent family in Lower Marlboro, Daniel and Ann Wheeler Kent. Now, this part is important. They had a son, Joseph, who by the time he was 20 was a doctor, a medical doctor. So you need about the same training to be a doctor then as you did now. He was upset with another doctor in 1799. As a result of that, he left Calvert County and went to Prince George's County, to Bladensburg. So that split the property. Ultimately, Joseph Kent acquired more land in Prince George's County. He eventually became the governor of Maryland in uh, 1826. He inherited the Lower Marlboro property, including the slaves that were there. So there were 37 slaves in Lower Marlboro and 300 slaves in Prince George's County. So when he passed away, his estate in Calvert County was put up for auction, including the slaves. One of those slaves was sold at auction in 1837 to James King. That was my great-great-grandmother. Her name was Susan. 
She was sold to James King, who was at King's Landing, which is where the park is now. James King, who had his own wife and family, he had three kids with her, fathered three more kids by my great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother. The first of those children, born in 1839, was my great-grandfather, Benjamin Kent. She continued to use the last name Kent, even though they really should be called King, because that was their father. So from that point on, Benjamin Kent and his descendants were always called mulatto. A lot of them looked white, could pass for white. Okay. So that's where the term mulatto comes from. And it was because of their history and longevity. Most of them lived to be, if not a hundred, over a hundred. And so they were able to pass on their stories to their uh, descendants. So I have talked to several uh, people who had talked to people that were slaves to get their information. So with that preface, then we go back to the actual black history of Calvert County. One of the major events happened, that happened was the War of 1812. In 1814, the British came through here on their way to Washington to burn the White House, which they successfully did. But on their way through, they wanted to disrupt the economy, both here and in St. Mary's. So they were trying to get as many slaves to run away as possible or to get on the ship with them. Um, so some did, some didn't. That was the first big decision that had to be made. Now, obviously they approached my family. The, the way we know what happened with that is the treaty after the war, the Treaty of Ghent, they uh, had to pay reparations to the slave owners in Calvert who lost their slaves. So that's how we know which properties they approached and who left. So the ones that left, and several people did leave, several families left, uh, ended up in Nova Scotia and in uh, Trinidad. So we actually have cousins there in different parts that went with these British. My family decided to stay, and I always wonder why. Why would you take that opportunity to go for freedom? Uh, there are a couple of big reasons why. Number one, when you were a slave, generally they try to separate family as soon as possible, or separate children from their parents, separate brothers and sisters from each other. Uh, the reason for doing that is they were outnumbered. You know, you're going to have a small family, but you're going to have to have 30, 40 slaves there. So if family members see other family members mistreated, they're more likely to take some action, some, some act of vengeance. And that's why they tried to separate them as soon as possible, put them on different farms, different locations. So one reason they wouldn't leave is they had family somewhere. They didn't know where. They didn't know how far away uh, that family was, but they knew if they got on that ship, they weren't going to be seeing their family again. Uh, the other reason is uh, they could see other ways out of slavery. So at some time early on like that they were baptizing some slaves and that could get you your freedom. You could always buy your freedom as well. <clears throat> and ultimately you could age out of slavery. Tobacco just like cotton is very hard, hard work and it ages you quickly. So usually by age 40 you're kind of used up, uh, male and female. And it's cheaper just to give you your freedom than to keep supporting someone that can't work for you anymore. So they saw other ways out other than running away and going someplace that they're not familiar with. Um, the, the clearest picture we have of how slave life was came from a man named Charles Ball. Now Charles Ball, uh, again, born here in Calvert County, early on he was separated from his family. He had a wife, children. He was sold down to North Carolina and then again to Georgia. He was down there for seven years before he was able to escape and work his way back here to Calvert County. That amazed me as well. Why would you come back to Calvert County? You're still in the slave state. He was coming back to his family. So after seven years, he worked his way back to the family. When he went down there, it took a month of marching and chains to get to North Carolina. When he came back, it took over a year. And I'm assuming then, I can't, didn't find any documentation on this, but I think he probably worked his way back. He wasn't hiding in the woods. I think he was working with uh, whites who were sympathetic to slaves. And that was part of the Underground Railroad, that they would give him work and housing from place to place, station to station, until he was able to get all the way back here to, uh, to Maryland, to Calvert County. So, but he made a different choice. Uh, other than running away when he got back to Calvert County, he did not go with the British, he did not uh, leave the family, he joined the American Navy, which was surprising, and he ended up serving with uh, Joshua Barney uh, 
I guess he figured they're going to appreciate what I've done and give me my freedom after that because he didn't have any free papers. So he did participate in the War of 1812. After the war, he started working on the farm where his wife was a slave. And at the end of the war, he, I'm sorry, at the end of uh, that time, he did write a book telling what slave life in Calvert was like, that you might have a cabin with maybe 20 people in it, 20 uh, slaves in a cabin, dirt floor. You had uh, clothing allowance once a year. That's for the adults, not for the children. Um, one meal a day. And you worked six days a week. On Sundays, they could have the day off or they could go to work for someone else. That's how they were making the money to buy their freedom. They could go work on another farm, or they could just go visit family if you knew where family was nearby. So he's working on this farm with his wife, who was a slave for this uh, slave owner. He knows that uh, Charles Ball is a runaway, but he doesn't report him. He's sympathetic to him. Eventually, Charles Ball is able to make enough money to buy his wife's freedom. They move out of Calvert County up near Baltimore. He gets his own place, his own farm up there. But again, if, unless you have the free papers, you're always subject to being taken into custody and sent back. So after a while, he was taken into custody. He was sent back to Georgia. He was able to escape yet again and still came back to his family in Baltimore. He was, it was a quicker trip back this time because he was able to stow away on a uh, merchant ship coming up the coast. Unfortunately, by the time he got back this time, his wife and children had been sold again into slavery, and he had no way of finding them. So the last that we know of Charles Ball, he was in Pittsburgh, and that's where he told his story to someone who published it as the, uh, a slave narrative. His was one of the earliest slave narratives in the uh, 1730s, sorry, the 1830s. So, and that became a model for other slaves to write their stories when they obtained their freedom. Now, Sometimes it could be very harsh life for a slave, and one of the stories that's told, and this happened in the 1830s, was of Isaac Brown, and that's one that you can look up. He became a symbol in the abolitionist movement. Isaac Brown was owned by someone in the southern part of the county, the Middleham area in Lusby, and the owner was shot, was ambushed and shot in the shoulder. The owner, without any justification or any proof, decided to blame Isaac Brown. He blamed Isaac because it was like 10 years earlier, he had killed Isaac's brother. Isaac's brother was also a slave uh, on his farm who had come back late from some event that he had permission to go to. That angered the owner and he killed him. And he always thought that Isaac, you know, how, again, I said, you don't want family around because they're going to hold this vengeance against you. He always thought Isaac was looking at him funny, you know, like he wanted to do something to him. So based on that alone, he decided that Isaac must be guilty of shooting him. So he charged him with the assault. He was alive, so he, they didn't hang him or anything. But they did take him to the Calvert County Jail and brutally whipped him over 100 lashes. They uh, then let him heal up. It took him a, well, more than a month to heal up. And then did the same thing again. So he whipped him 100 times so that he was all bloody. When he was healed again, then they sold him. They were going to sell him down south. So they took him to Baltimore to go to New Orleans for a slave auction. He was able to escape. Uh, with the help of Quakers and make his way to Philadelphia. Now the same thing happens. He wanted to be with his family as well. So the Quakers contacted his family here in Maryland to let them know that he was okay. That alerted Calvert County that he was still around. So Calvert County went to the governor, who then petitioned the governor of Pennsylvania to have him brought back here again because they wanted to punish him some more. So while that case was going on and became a national cause for abolitionist rights, uh, the Quakers were able to free him again and get him all the way up to Canada this time. So this person then in Canada became a medical doctor for the rest of his life. He went to school, became a medical doctor, treating both blacks and whites, whereas he was just something to be whipped here in Maryland. But he was a valued person for the rest of his life up in Canada. Okay. That's the really bad part about it. The 18... 90 census, I'm sorry, 1790 census, shows there were over 8,000 free blacks in Maryland. So there were other free blacks around and working at different trades. One of the things you're going to see in the Calvert County census, when you look up blacks from that time period, from the 1840s, 50s, 60s, a lot of sailors. I had a great uncle, great great uncle, who was also a seaman, a merchant seaman. They were able to leave the country, go to other places, you know, this is commercial goods that they're transporting, not military. 
go to other countries, and then come back to the United States. Now, aboard ship, uh, for those of you who have been in the service, everybody's the same. What mattered was your experience. So everybody ate together, worked together, slept together because it was such a small space. And what mattered again was experience. So usually um, the young white sailors that would come on couldn't stand the harsh treatment that come in at 16, 17 just to get away from home. Once the first tour was up, they would get off ship and leave. There's got to be something better on land. The blacks that would come on would stay. Stay for years and years, stay for 10, stay for 20 years because they knew it was miserable for them on land. And they were making great money at sea. You can make, this is again in the 1830s and 40s, 30 to $60 a month serving aboard ship. And because everything was equal about aboard ship, if you were a senior person, a senior black person, you could punish a junior white person. So you may have a situation where a black sailor could get the uh, lashes to a white sailor. And there's a story of a of a black sailor having punished a white sailor at sea, giving him the lashes. Then as soon as the ship came into port, they got off, that same black sailor would have to bow his head as he was walking by that white uh, sailor that he had punished earlier. Just two different standards to go by. But the blacks, for the most part, were not happy with slavery and, and wanted to keep away as, as much as possible. There is a, uh, some of the black sailors that uh, did work for the Americans, did serve during World War, I'm sorry, the War of 1812, were captured and taken to Darfur prison in England. When the war was over, they held a protest, a riot, they didn't want to come back to the United States. They were held there an additional four months until they could negotiate where they were going to go to because they didn't want to come back here, especially to the southern part of the United States. So some did eventually come back to northern parts of the United States, but even that wasn't really safe during that time because you still could be sent south as a runaway slave. Right? So when the Civil War came, there were many blacks from Calvin County who served. Uh, most people don't know that just over the Benedict Bridge there, to the left, was Camp Stanton. And that was a colored training for colored troops, training ground for colored troops. There were 6,000 colored troops that were trained there at uh, Camp Stanton. It's hard to see. There is a marker there. As soon as you get over the bridge, you really have to look fast to your left to see it. And they tried to divide the, uh, the regiments by counties. So all the Calvary County soldiers would be together, the Prince George's County soldiers together, the ones from the Eastern Shore together. They felt that if you were around someone that had similar experiences to you and might know some of the same people, that you were less likely to be homesick or to run away or just give up on this while the training was going on. So the Calvary County soldiers were together uh, well, all of them, as a matter of fact, were in the same miserable circumstances. More black colored soldiers died at Camp Stanton than died in the Civil War. The main reason is, and again, they didn't know, sanitation. So they had their water supply uh, down at the bottom of the hill, and they had the outhouses, the uh, privies at the top. So it was just and any kind of disease you can think of, yellow fever, malaria, whatever, any type of airborne disease, they got it, and they died from it there at Camp Stan. But while they were there, they tried to amuse themselves, just like you did in the field. You'd make up songs to sing. Uh, the commander of, the, uh, of Camp Stanton was white. All the officers were white. He was walking through the Calvert County group one night, regiment one night, he heard a song. He wrote the song down, and it was called They Look Like Men of War. That officer later uh, joined the Freedmen's Bureau and then later became the president of Hampton University. And this is where I found this. He had uh, archived that song as the first black battle hymn. So the, the song, They Look Like Men of War, is credited to being written by the soldiers from Calvert County. Of course, they didn't get a dime from it because they didn't know about copywriting. And it was actually copyrighted by the Mormon Church uh, in the 1880s. And the Mormon Church was still making it. Uh, money off of that song that's written by blacks. The second thing that's significant about the uh, Civil War and the Calvert County soldiers is that the white soldiers signed up for the duration of the war. I mean, as soon as the war was over, we were done. The Calvert County soldiers signed a three-year contract. Whether they came in in 1863 or 1864, the war ended in 1865, and they were like, you know, we saw the white soldiers throwing away the guns and starting to run home, and they were like, you can't go anywhere. You're not done. You have to sign a three-year contract and you have to stay. So the Calvert County soldiers were 
They came to Baltimore after the war. As a matter of fact, they served in battle. They were all the way down in Florida, and they were working their way back up. They were just outside of Appomattox when the war ended. They thought they could go home from there, from Virginia. But they were taken to Baltimore, put on a ship, and taken down to guard the Texas-Mexico border for the next couple of years. So finally, in 1866, 1867, they were allowed to come home and actually be free for the first time to go where they wanted to go without uh, asking someone or having someone stop them. When they came back, this is where the hard work starts in building a society, uh, the schools and uh, churches. There was a little head start that they had. Again, I'm going to go back to 1837. Born in Calvert County was a man named Nathaniel uh, Carroll. Nathaniel Carroll called himself N.M. He's still known as N.M. Carroll today. He was born in an area called Smithville, which is around Dunford. Some of you may know that. But he first shows up in the 1850 census. He was living as a servant in the Dow family home, uh, which is around where the Sunderland Parking Ride is now. And it turns out he and his brother were working there for the Dows, not as slaves, but as uh, servants, to earn money to buy their father's freedom. They were finally able to buy their father's freedom in 1857, and the whole family moved up to Baltimore. Uh, the other family members went to work. N.M. Carroll went to school. He went to the Freedman School, then he eventually went to uh, seminary school, became a minister, eventually went to Morgan State University, and eventually got his Ph.D. and became Dr. Carroll. But he was at one of the most historic black churches in Baltimore, Sharp Street Church. So Sharp Street Church is where the first really black movement started. They created what was called the uh, Society of Galilean Fishermen. And it's a uh, benevolent society to help blacks coming out of slavery. To help them with food, help them with uh, medical expenses, help them uh, with death benefits. Somebody would have to help bury them because you're not going to get retirement benefits being a slave. So he was there, but he kept coming back to Calvert County and he was bringing that information back. Um, one of the reasons he was coming back is because of a girl. We're always going to come back for your girl. We ended up marrying a Calvert County girl, uh, Carolyn Jones. It's probably a bunch of people related to her here. They ended up having nine kids. Um, matter of fact, she died. And then he married again and had two more kids. He married a lady from Prince George's County, a school teacher. But he was bringing back the information about the uh, Galilean fishermen. And this society is one of the unique ones. who spoke men and women that were in that. They didn't discriminate. Men and women were officers in the uh, Society of Galilee and Fishermen. So if you look at the old deeds here in Calvert County, the first churches that were started and the land the schools were on, the trustees of those places were members of the Galilean Fishermen. They were the ones uh, gathering together, collecting the money, and building churches and schools. Now the schools, of course, were the one-room schoolhouses here. They only went to the seventh grade and everybody in the same classroom. But Carroll brought that information back. He also was at the Sharp Street Church in 1865 when Frederick Douglass came there uh, to speak. It was the first time Frederick Douglass had come back to Maryland because uh, he was still a fugitive slave while slavery was going on. So he had run away from the Eastern Shore. He never came back uh, through, uh, well, to Baltimore or any place near there while he was still a fugitive slave because he could have been sent back uh, into slavery. And so when he gave his message, about never giving up, keep trying, succeed at all costs, and look out for your family, N.M. Carroll brought that message back to Capra County. As a matter of fact, N.M. Carroll uh, started the first old age home for blacks in Baltimore, and was a model for other old age homes in the city. Oh, well, not in the city, but in the country. N.M. Carroll's old age home uh, is still, the name is still there. It's now called N.M. Manor Senior Apartments in Baltimore, but it survived to today. It started in the 1880s. Uh, and so he built up all that. He had a doctorate and everything. He was interviewed by the Afro-American newspaper before he died in the late uh, 1930s. And they went through all of his accomplishments, uh, you know, as far as the schooling, the churches he'd started. He renovated like 20 churches in Baltimore City. And he said of all that, the thing that he's most proud of was the 10 years he worked in Calvert County to buy his father's freedom. But he was an inspiration to the people here in Calvert County. So, and as I said, the school system, first through seventh grade, but they had that drive to go far, farther than that. 
So one of the ways that you could do that is the churches gathered together, banded together to do a scholarship. Not many could afford that. Okay. So one of the first scholarships was to another uh, individual, uh, William Sampson Brooks. You may be familiar with William Sampson Brooks High School. So William Sampson Brooks was born in 1865 here in Calvert. He was born in Lower Marlboro, but he was working for the Bowen family down in uh, Prince Frederick. I could call it Bowensville, because up until 1957, that area from uh, Adelina to uh, Graves Road was called Bowensville. They had their own post office and everything. I could you because know, Bowens ran things. So he was going to church at <laughs> across the street, and I don't know if this was named after N.M. Carroll or not, but it was Carroll Church. It's now Carroll Western Church, and they've moved it, but it was on Barstow Road at that time. The cemetery is still there. So Carroll Church put together money for scholarship, and they had a a contest it came down to the last two people, and that was William Sampson Brooks and another boy named Hezekiah Mason. Hezekiah Mason, familiar with Mason Road, his family owned all of that land on Mason Road. He had over 300 acres there, and he decided to stay there and work the land as opposed to going to school in Baltimore. So William Sampson Brooks did go up there to Baltimore. He became a uh, minister as well. He went to Morgan, started off as a seminary school, and then to Morgan. He eventually became a bishop of the AME Church, and he traveled the world. He wrote a book, What a Black Man Saw in a White Man's World. He started churches in four different cities. He started uh, a school and church in Liberia. Um, when he died in the 1934, he was so popular around the country that he had funerals in four different cities. And they, they kind of treated him like a rock star. The, uh, the newspaper transcripts say that there were hundreds and hundreds of people from Calvert County that came up for the two-day services that they had for him in Baltimore. So that's why they ended up naming the high school after him. He was that popular in 1934. And again, the reason I know some of these things, these people that were here in Calvert County and left, they their records were preserved. So it didn't matter to them that the courthouse burned down. Just like it was fortunate that my family, fortunate or unfortunate, my family was owned by the governor of Maryland. So his records were archived in Annapolis, not at the courthouse. That's how we know that stuff. These other people that were here, left and, and thrived in Baltimore, kept their records and their notes about what was going on in Calvert County as well. So it wasn't lost to fires. All right? So William Sampson Brooks is one example of getting a scholarship to come up. But if you couldn't, most people aren't going to get a scholarship from the church. But other family members wanted their children to be educated. And the only way to be educated was to come to Baltimore. Okay. So what they did was the older children, and this started right after slavery, parents and the older children in the family would work with the idea of saving money for the younger ones to go to school later on. And you Calvert County people know you're going to have 13, 14 kids in your family. So you got 10, 12, 13 kids working, saving money for number 13 and number 14 that's coming along years later to pay for their education up in Baltimore. It was usually at Frederick Douglass High School up there. So during that time, and my grandmother told me that she took the trip many times, she was born in 1893, to get to Baltimore would be an all-day trip. You go to, uh, she would go to the ferry boat at the end of Plum Point Road, get on that about six or seven in the morning, and then they, she would be at the bottom of the boat with the livestock and the cargo that was going to Baltimore. The whites would be at the top of the boat. Then they would go across the bay to the eastern shore. They'd shove in some more livestock on her and cargo while she was crunched down at the bottom. <coughs> then it would leave and go back into Baltimore from there and get into Baltimore six or seven o'clock at night. So it was an all-day trip. So you pretty much had to live in Baltimore if you were going to go to school up there. So the older kids and family members would work for the younger ones to go with. Uh, so the younger ones didn't have to do anything except meet two requirements. Number one, you had to be a boy, then sexism, you can't waste an education on a girl. Number two, you had to be light-skinned enough, and that's again where the mulatto comes in, light-skinned enough where you could possibly pass for white or pass for some other race. Again, you have a better chance of getting a job. You can always go somewhere else and be white, or go somewhere else and be some other race, okay, and have the money that you can send back to your family. That system worked very well and no one was angry about it or anything. Again, my father was born in 1914. He went to school uh, in Baltimore 
uh, in the 1920s, and it was because he was very light skinned. He could pass for white till the day he died. And he lived to be 100. But he wasn't angry, but he would laugh, and he'd say, You know, I had these cousins that were brown skinned, they were so much smarter than me, but I was picked to go to school because of the way I looked. Okay. Other families did it uh, successfully. One of the most successful, successful ones was the Bourne family at the southern end of the county. Uh, their descendants are still there now. So the first oldest son out, or he was actually the second youngest son out, they had a family of like 13 or 14 that worked for him to go to school. Uh, he became the first licensed doctor of Calvert County in 1902. He was a black male, but he was passing for white. He ended up getting his degrees, got his uh, medical license, and he went to Fresher uh, County to practice medicine, where they wouldn't know that he was black. His, uh, and he actually built a hospital there. He was very successful and built a hospital. His younger brother was uh, um, James Franklin Warren. He went to New Jersey and became a pharmacist. He died fairly young in his 20s, but he had a son before he died, James Franklin Warren Jr. James Jr., uh, with his father's money and inheritance, was able to come back to Howard University. He became a lawyer ultimately became the first black district court judge in Prince George's in Montgomery County. And the courthouse in Upper Marlboro has a wing named after him, the James Franklin Bourne Wing. Uh, and the Bar Association, the Black Bar Association is named after him, the James Franklin Bourne Jr. Bar Association. And that's all because of, again, starting with a one-room uh, education here in Calvert County in this blossom. And again, that's how when people become successful somewhere else, you can preserve that information so that we have it. So other people tried it. It wasn't always successful. I've said it different times. There were different soldiers that tried to uh, uh, shift uniforms. Um, they had language difficulties. The one I interviewed was a World War II soldier. Uh, said that he tried to do it, but that he tried to put on a British soldier's uh, uniform. And he said, I could have gotten away with it, but he said, I just couldn't speak the language because of these different words that the Brits use for different things. He ultimately got in trouble uh, when he was always moping and looking around uh, down. Somebody came up to him and the British call cigarettes fags. So somebody came up to him and said, you know, you look like you could use a fag. So, <laughs> after he hit the guy, they arrested him. And he told me he ended up doing six months in the guardhouse. We sent him back to his American unit and did six months in the guardhouse. We were uh, trying to do that. So Calvert County struggled and struggled to try to get that higher education for years. They did gimmicky things. They had all the one-room schoolhouses at graduation at the same time in the uh, early 1920s. So you had like 49 kids graduated that were all 12 and 13 years old. But that didn't move the county. They weren't going to budge on letting the kids have a high school education. Reason being, they were still outnumbering whites, probably 70 to 30 percent at that time in the 1920s. And the worst thing that could happen to you is to be, one, to be outnumbered, and even worse than that, is to be outnumbered by educated people. Because then they would start voting and taking the jobs and things, and the whites couldn't stand that. So that's why they resisted having a higher education for blacks here in Calgary <coughs> County at that time. So even with the one-room schoolhouses things, they had to ship in uh, people, teachers here, to teach the schools from Pennsylvania and other places. Because coming out of slavery, they didn't have anybody here in Calgary County that could read or write, I mean, that was black, to teach the kids. So that's why they had to recruit the teachers down here. It was not illegal to know how to read if you were black prior to the end of uh, slavery. But it was illegal to possess abolitionist material. So who determines what's abolitionist material? Whoever is mad at you and wants you to turn you in. So the penalty for having abolitionist material was 20 years. So there was one black up in the Eastern Shore, he was sentenced to 10 years because he was found to have a copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin at his house. So that's why they were fearful of that. Uh, you couldn't secretly teach a bunch of people to read uh, if you remember Nat Turner's revolt, where he killed a bunch of white uh, slave owners, after that happened, everybody panicked, you know, in the South and all the way up to Maryland. The Maryland General Assembly passed specific laws based on that. They passed one law that said that you couldn't have more than four blacks congregating together without having at least one respectable white person in the room. So that's why there were never any churches or anything organized school system until the end of the Civil War, because it was actually legislated against. 
You couldn't go somewhere else, get an education and come back. Even if you were a free black, you were regulated. If you left the area and somebody noticed that you were gone for more than 10 days, they could report you and you could be sold into slavery, even if you were free, because they didn't want you going up north, getting abolitionist ideas or an education, and then coming back here to Maryland and spreading it around. Okay? That's how they restrict them, that growth. So they went out, got teachers to come here who had been in northern places to educate, but they still wanted more and not getting it. What changed things and what uh, shoved them into the future, so to speak, was someone that wasn't born here, and uh, his name was Albert Cassell. Albert Cassell was born in 1895 in Towson, and his dream was to go to, not to the Howard University or whatever, but to go to Cornell. His mother gave him her life savings. Um, this had to be around 1912, 1913. Life savings for a train ticket to New York to get to Cornell. And then once he got there, he was able to get a job as a, uh, in a hotel to pay for his education at Cornell. He became a, an architect, a celebrated architect, and he designed a lot of the buildings at Howard University. He also designed a lot of government buildings. So when the Depression, well, let me jump back a little bit because I want to add. He only went to three years of college because at the fourth year, World War I had started and he was drafted. And if you served in World War I and you, came, and you were in college and you came back, they gave you credit for your time in service. So he didn't have to finish his uh, final year of college and got his degree that way. Um, I wanted to skip back to World War I because we had seven black soldiers from Calvert County who fought and died in World War I. What's key to that is that while they were fighting for their country, at the same time, they sent all black soldiers to France. And the United States government sent a letter to France. And the letter said, don't eat with them, don't sleep with them, don't socialize with them, keep away from them. We don't want them coming back here up again. That was their big fear. That's why they sent them all to the same place. The French laughed at it. They thought it was silly. And they did socialize with them, eat with them, sleep with them, everything else. That's why a lot of soldiers went back to France after the war, and a lot of uh, celebrities and famous people that could afford to leave the United States ended up going to live in France uh, during segregation because they didn't discriminate there. Uh, getting back to Cassell, Cassell was making tons of money even during the Depression because of the, the, uh, the rents and revenues he was getting from his buildings and from the, uh, the United States government for all that he was doing there in Washington, D.C. He had several homes, he had uh, cars, and this is in the 1920s, cars, he had maids. What was frustrating to him was, with all of that, he had to meet with uh, the people that were building the buildings that he was designing, and these were usually white builders. He would have to scout out where they were going to meet, at least a day in advance, to make sure there was some place he'd be able to go to the bathroom, with, because segregation, he couldn't go into certain buildings. He didn't know where he'd be able to eat. He had to go ahead of time to find out a place where he could eat, go to the, the restaurant. So it became his dream to uh, have a black settlement, because other black settlements did exist across the country, where he could have the freedom to go where he wanted to, when he wanted to. As luck would have it, he found 300 acres available in Calvert County at the end of Dares Beach Road. And he had the dream of building what he was going to call, or did call, Calvert Town down there. And it was going to be a black Atlantic city with casinos, with schools, post offices, and everything. Everything that you can imagine. And his plan said that it would uh, encompass 5,000 employees initially to build for the construction part, and then have at least 300 permanent employees. So Calvert didn't know about that until very late, and that's when he applied, uh, Roosevelt came into office, and in 1932 had the New Deal, so he applied for money through the New Deal. Uh, it was uh, 9,000, I'm not sorry, not, 9 million in grants and another 9 million in loans in order to get this project going. And he received preliminary approval. When he received that preliminary approval to build Calvert Town, that's when Calvert County found out about it. Okay? Mm -hmm. At that time, there wasn't any planning and zoning or anything, so Calvert County couldn't stop it. If you had land, you could build on it. You could do what you wanted on it. And he had been bringing in architects and engineers into his offices after hours at Howard to design windmills and things like that to generate your own electricity so that he wouldn't have any need for any government entity whatsoever to be completely self-sufficient. But Calvert County 
went to their two senators, I don't know who they were at that time, and got them to put pressure on the Secretary of Interior to withdraw that offer of money. Um, but the Secretary of Interior said that uh, you're going to have to give us something in exchange for this. Because they looked at the census and they said there's massive poverty in Calvert County. No one can read or write. We've got to put people back to work. So he said, the least you can do then, if we're not going to give him the money, you're going to have to build schools for him so that they can get educated and have an opportunity for, uh, for work down there. So that was the, the devil's deed is how Calvert County got the, uh, the first high school. Because Calvert had a black high school well in advance of other more urban areas that went into the 1940s and some places 1950s prior to getting a high school uh, for blacks. But that was the pressure that they had to get the school or otherwise be stuck with this uh, black Calvert town. And they knew that the skill set wasn't here in Calvert County to do those jobs so that blacks would be coming in from Baltimore or from probably as far away as Philadelphia to populate Calvert County. So it would have been a completely different Calvert County had his plan gone through because all the whites would have said no and left. And this would be Prince George's County instead of Calvert County. Um, so they had it stopped, but Cassell, again, was, uh, was not going to give up his dream easily, so he tried to get private funding. So they came after him because of that and did things like they went to the president of Howard University and worked on him, and he uh, eventually relented and he came to Cassell and said, well, you were having private meetings uh, in these offices here. You need to pay us rent for all the time that you were in there and had other people in there that were not doing university business. Okay. So eventually he lost his job at Howard. He still kept trying. Um, he ended up dying fairly young, early 70s, uh, in 1969. Could have been because of the stress. Could have been because he married three times. <laughs> Go over there to you can still see a Cassell Boulevard, and a lot of those streets over there are named after his children and wives, plural. Uh, so I think the whole thing was sold in 1969 after he passed as track housing, small low income housing. But it wasn't a dream that he wanted to, to happen there. The second event that affected things in Calvert County, as a matter of fact, across the world, uh, was from a young lady named Henrietta Lacks, who everybody should be aware of. Henrietta Lacks was born in 1920 in Virginia. She was probably the fourth or fifth of uh, ten children. When number ten was born, her mother died in childbirth. Father, was typical, couldn't handle that, so he farmed the kids out to different uh, family members. So she ended up with a family member, and of course back then you're poor, and a lot of you remember this, you never had your own bed. You were sleeping two, three, four, six in a bed at times, uh, both boys and girls in some cases. So by the time she was uh, 13, 14, she was pregnant by her cousin. Um, there shouldn't be a lot of shocked looks in here. You know, Calvert's population is so small that if you're not, if you're a native of Calvert, if you're not married to your cousin, more than likely your parents are cousins. So it's not <laughs> The population never went much over 12,000 all the way up through 1960. And again, people were having 10, 12 kids. So you have to do the math on that to figure out how you know. So she got pregnant, and then she got pregnant again by the same cousin a couple of years later, and they decided to marry. And they came to Maryland because somebody promised them a job and went up uh, near Baltimore. They had a few more kids, and then she became ill. She went to Johns Hopkins University turned out to be cervical cancer. Um, she ended up dying there, but they did remove uh, cells that turned out to be these amazing cells that could live outside the body, and they haven't been able to find anybody else in history ever that that happened. So because of her cells, they were able to find cures for smallpox and polio and things like that, and they think it may be the key to uh, various cancers as well. That being said, that made people all of a sudden want to be around blacks, not uh, to socialize with, but to experiment on. So years before that, going back to 1911, uh, the government, Maryland, built Crownsville, which was a hospital for the colored insane. Again, what's worse than being educated black is being crazy in black. You know what a crazy black man do? Uh, they'll go off because they're afraid, right? So that was started in 1911. When Henrietta Lacks died in 1951, when that it was well known in the medical uh, field what had happened. Her family never knew. Family didn't know until 30, 40, 
years later. But the medical community knew. So then they started doing experiments on people in Crownsville. There were a lot of people, a lot of blacks from Crownsville, I'm oh, sorry, from Calvert County, they were at Crownsville. You didn't really have to be insane, you just had to be different. You acted odd or something like that, they'd send you to Crownsville. And every young person here, well, we're telling you the time, was threatened by their parents, threatened by their teachers. You keep acting like that, you're going to send you to Crownsville. Okay? Because everybody knew about it was afraid of what was going to happen there. Uh, they just finished uh, doing some archaeology there. More people have died there than le ever left there. They found 1,800 unmarked graves, mostly of children that they're trying to uh, somehow identify. Uh, so it's still a big project going on there. They're, they want to make it into a museum now. But, uh, some people want to have it as a drug facility, but they're working on making it a museum. It's like 1,200 acres or something, so they want to make part of it uh, a museum. But, and then the corpses that they dug up were usually things with uh, holes drilled in their heads. Those are the kind of experiments they were doing on them at uh, Crownsville, trying to figure out what's going on. But even with that, you know, you still kind of shunned black people, even through the 1950s. Uh, here in Calvert County, uh, everything was segregated, uh, like the libraries and all the public buildings. So in the 1950s, they said, well, we want our kids to keep reading. The blacks said, we want our kids to keep reading in the summertime, because you had books in school, but not books in the summertime. So the way to get them to read in the summertime was to have a bookmobile. And the bookmobile could then go out into the neighborhoods and the kids could read. You didn't have to worry about them being in the library with other whites. The judge, his name was Judge Duke. Uh, Duke Street is named after him. And of course, the old library was across from the uh, post office on Duke Street. He was in charge of the library and he was totally against it. And he went to the uh, uh, commissioner's meeting to, to fight for it. So we had the transcript at the commissioner's meeting where he said we cannot have uh, black people having access to books at all. He says there's some fine black people, but very few. Uh, most were steel. And he said many had venereal diseases, which you can spread through books. So he was defeated when they pointed out to him that he had uh, blacks cleaning his house. He had blacks doing his laundry. He had blacks cooking his food. So if he was that worried about disease, he wouldn't have had blacks going to his <laughs> So, and we did have, uh, through the 30s and 40s, some local heroes here in Calvert County as well. Hopefully everybody now is aware of uh, Harriet Elizabeth Brown. Uh, in 1937, she found that she was making less money than a white teacher at the same skill level counterpart. She was making $600, not a month, $600 a year. The white female teacher was making $1,200 a year. Males always made more. Black or white, they were going to make more money. So when she found that out, she uh, filed a complaint. The uh, NAACP sent uh, a young attorney, Thurgood Marshall, here to Calvert County <coughs> to help her out. They had to send someone to help her because when they first started getting teachers uh, back in the 1880s, they had them sign a contract promising not to marry and not to socialize with the local community. So they were kind of here by themselves. They wanted the children to be their family. Plus, it was so difficult to find teachers and bring them here. You didn't want to have to go through that process again if they married. Okay. So all growing up, and those of you that were in segregated schools, remember you had Miss Jones, Miss Brown, Miss whoever, Miss Harris. Okay. And I just thought, could you know your teachers? That they were just too mean that nobody wanted to marry. I didn't realize that. So, so they, couldn't, they couldn't get married. It actually backfired on them at one point because uh, the lady from Hidden Figures, uh, Mary Winston Jackson, she was just Mary Winston at that time, came here to Calvert, 1942, her first year out of uh, Hampton University, and she was teaching math. But she wanted to get married, and they said, no, you know, you've got it in your contract, you're going to lose your job. So she decided to marry instead, so she went back to Hampton and married, and ultimately um, ended up at NASA as one of the uh, mathematicians there, and the movie Hidden, Hidden Figures was written about her uh, and a couple other very nice ladies. So we're moving up on the hour, and I'm going to give some time, like five minutes, for questions. But I want to appreciate your attention. I hope it hasn't been too boring. Um, we're just getting up to the civil rights era. But if anybody has a couple of questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, ma'am? When will your book be ready? Whenever the publisher does. One of the things we argue about, uh, which angered me, and I actually switched to a different publisher because of that, they said, you know, 
uh, your pictures are all grainy. And I said, because it did. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, can you get the originals? The people I've uh, got the pictures from, most had passed away, okay? And they were their family photos that they gave me, and I copied. And every time you copy, it gets grainier and grainier. And then they came back and said, well, we have access to the Library of uh, Congress where you can get generic pictures of blacks to put in there. And I'm, saying, I'm pretty sure people are going to recognize that's not grandpa. <laughs> So I ended up having to leave them and go to somebody else. Yes? I think that segregation continues by choice, especially in churches. When I first moved to Calvert County, I um, had lived abroad. And when I went to this white church, I asked the minister why there weren't any black people in the congregation. And he said, I would give anything if there were. And that um, Easter, a uh, neighboring black Methodist church invited the, us to attend their Good Friday service. And there were five of us whites who went to that church. And it was a totally different yes. uh, experience for me. I've never forgotten it. And it, um, maybe if you could address that or... Well, I did look that up, actually, because it, it, I always wondered when I was going to funerals why they would read the obituary. And I was like, I know how to read. Why do you stand there and read the obituary? And finally they explained to me that back in the old days nobody could read except for possibly the pastor. And coming out of slavery, again, no one could read. But you were attending church. Sometimes the slave owner would take you to church. The way they learned uh, the word of the Bible was through song. That's why there's more singing in the black church than in the white church, is because they're singing what they've learned. Okay? And that's why the services go on and on after song after song. But it's just a different way of learning something uh, memorized. They're not integrated. Again, different. I don't, you know, it's just, I don't know why it's still the name, but again, it's just a different method of uh, worshiping, more singing, jumping up and down, dancing, yeah. because that was the tradition. Yes, sir. When you're telling your. When you were, were talking about how Mr. King, he had a he basically had a black family and a white family. Yes. Did 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 those have those descendants ever met in time or is that been yeah, Yes, we got together a couple of times uh, with the Kings, the King family. Um, if you go back on King's Landing, because my family is still there today, go back on King's Landing where that big tower is to the left, the slave cabins were to the right. Uh, over there. In eighteen fifty uh, James King gave 25 acres to his mistress, to my great-great-grandmother, Susan Kent. He gave her 25 acres there and her freedom in 1850. He also donated money to, uh, to the first church they had there, Black Church, Young's Church, that the family used. So he wasn't a bad person. Now, my great-grandfather, his oldest son, he took to live into his, well, sort of in his house. Back then they had the house and they had a separate kitchen that was outside just in case there was a fire. That's where he stayed. He had a loft in that kitchen. Uh, you know, so he was like two miles away from his mother. But uh, he wasn't, uh, according to people, wasn't a bad guy. Of course, when he died, again, the courthouse had already burned down a couple of times. He lived, and that's where the longevity came back from the beginning. He was born in 1803, died in 1895. Of course, the courthouse had burned down, so there was no record of his will. His surviving white daughters went in and said, uh, we're the only children. There isn't anyone else. Didn't mention the black kids at all. So they inherited everything, all of the land. Uh, and he had over 12,000 acres at one point. So there was so much that they said, we don't need all this. And they donated, which is now King's Landing Park, all of that land down there, uh, over 400 acres. They donated that to All Saints Church, which was the family church, their family church. Just about everybody in the North's family church. All Saints Church was the same thing. We don't need all this land. They sold it to Goodman Goldstein, Louis Goldstein's father. Uh, after a few years, Goodman Goldstein sold it to the Black YMCA of Baltimore, which turned it into Camp Mohawk, which was there for years and years. When Camp Mohawk came out to, to survey the land, they were the same way. We don't need all of this land. They had asked my father uh, to help them survey it, to walk the land. So as they were walking, he agreed to buy 125 acres of it. Previous to that, my great-grandfather had purchased 80 acres from the King family, 
My grandparents, uh, Daniel and Gussie, did purchase over 300 acres also from the King family. So even though they didn't inherit it, they eventually worked their way back there and bought it. <laughs> yes? To touch on that young lady's question, um, I know earlier in your uh, presentation you said that if you were baptized uh, as a slave, you could gain your freedom. Can you elaborate on that a little? Well, because it humanized people, this is through the uh, um, Episcopal Church at that time, because you had these parishes, you pretty much had All Saints up here and Middleham Parish down there. But this was very early in the uh, 1800s. Uh, that went out of fashion once there were a few slave revolts and totally disappeared after Nat Turner's revolt. Uh, because, you know, again, you, you would humanize someone if they're baptized and you didn't want to treat them that way if you were a Christian. Yes, sir. Um, I read there was an article a while back about uh, St. Edmund's Church uh, in Delray Road. And it went back, they gave the age of the church and went back right to, I think, right after the Civil War. Yes. So, so it prompts the question with me during slave times, were there black churches? No. Um, there were blacks attending white churches. So, for example, Patuxent. Any of the churches you go to that had the balconies, they were white churches and the slaves or the blacks were up in the balcony. The whites were down and the slaves were up. In that article on St. Edmunds, uh, the pastor, Joan Jones, said that she didn't, re didn't know, didn't remember why it was named St. Edmunds. So I looked it up. I went back and I found through old newspaper clippings and articles that there was a white family named Edmunds that donated uh, an acre for a log cabin. And so that's why they called them St. Edmunds, okay, and, and named it that way. But it was again joint black and white together, and then it split off later. Do you happen to know when Ward's Church was built, was constituted? No, I don't. So, have you done any of the research on the civil rights era? What, what was happening in Howard County? Yes. We just didn't have enough time to go to all the things. All right, another presentation. One of the things, one of the things that triggered it actually in Cabot County was the proximity to Washington, D.C. because you had all the embassies there. Everybody in the embassies were people of color. They wanted to go out on the weekends with their families and they could go north, but they couldn't go south, you know, and get into restaurants and things like that. So it was actually the federal government that started putting pressure on the uh, southern uh, states and counties to change that. And they, so they had the Public Accommodations Act that they tried to get passed in 1960. And that was one that Calvary County vetoed and said, we don't want that. They didn't pass it until like 1963 to allow uh, and that's only if you're on a, a state highway that they had to give you access. Yes, ma'am. Do you have an estimate of the number of African Americans living in California today whose descendants select politics? No idea. <clears throat> no, I don't. I know we're shrunk. We're like 13% of the population. Well, yeah, the entire population. Yeah. But, I mean, so it started at 70, is that right now? 70 percent you had to have the labor, yeah, so you're going to have a whole lot more labor than you have uh, landowners. And then after the uh, Civil War, when they lost that labor, the blacks were used to doing the hard work. So when the farms went up for sale, um, usually tax sales, the blacks were buying because they could work large tracts of land. They were used to it. The whites weren't used to it and couldn't handle it. And that's when they acquired a lot of land right after slavery, um, yeah, right at the end of the Civil War. And then later lost it, but, okay. General? The um, recent very popular Green Book that was really illuminating for a lot of us. Did you recall in your family, was there a Green Book that applied to Calvert County or any establishments perhaps where black people could go? Well, there are a lot of black establishments that they could go to. As far as <coughs> white establishments, I mean, that's one of the reasons we're still here. They never went anywhere. They never left Calvert County, so they didn't need any kind of guide as to what was uh, available in other places. Now, I have a copy of the Green Book. Calvert County wasn't important enough for people to visit because it's a dead area. My father had a copy of it. I remember when we used to travel, we would use it to get to go down to uh, Tennessee to take a class and had a copy of it so we'd know where to stay and where to stop. But if you want to get a copy of it, you can go on Amazon.com and they have uh, replicated copies of the Green Book. I have one out in the car if you want to wait around I'll go about talking. <laughs> <laughs> I keep one in the car because you know it's still not <laughs> 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 
Yeah. I just want you know, you talk a lot about Calvert County and it's fascinating. Did Calvert County differ very much from some of the other Southern Maryland counties or something that distinguished the history here yeah. on the St. Charles Island? I didn't look into that, but I wouldn't think so. I think it would be pretty similar everywhere. And just everybody seemed to want to get to Washington, D.C. or to Baltimore. So I think it's the same migration route. And those that wanted to stay just dealt with what was there. Yes. I know you said your ancestor, one of your uncles, was a merchant seaman. Yes. Do you think doing the, of course, slaves were merchandise. Do you think he uh, actually worked on a slave ship? Well, this is one of the things, I never talk about things I can't verify, but one of the things that is uh, in my family history is that he went over to the Philippines and bought a Japanese wife and brought her back here to the United States. Because, you know, blacks did own slaves, but he bought a wife, supposedly, and came back here. And a lot of our family members have what looks like slanted eyes in them, and that's where that came from. But I haven't been able to find a document or anything to actually verify that. But I'm sure it probably happened. Thank you very much. Library project. We have some available in the back if you don't already have any. Actually, Mr. Kent worked very hard on this project also. But it's the inspiring African-American women of Calvert County and the men, $5 each. <laughs> <laughs>